Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're all here. I'm looking at our, at our panelists. Um, and thank you so much, all of you, for turning up in such numbers on a, a wet Tuesday in the first week of some people's half term or indeed some people's full lockdown. But we've got an absolutely formidable team here today. I'm excluding myself, but we've obviously got some, some real hard hitters. Charlie Corey Wright, Neil Block, Emily Formby, Ashley Pratt. Um, and what we are going to do is, is a somewhat different approach, we hope, to, to this issue. We are going to consider the aspects, both from the claimants and the defendants' point of view, amongst us on this panel, we act um, for claimants and defendants. So this isn't, uh, this is a, a sort of, as it said, a unisex approach rather than a, a centric approach. Um, and we are going to assume that most of you have got a, a fair amount of knowledge of Swift and Carpenter, if not SCFS, which is Swift and Carpenter fatigue syndrome, a, a well-known syndrome that is coming in uh, at the moment. Um, we are going to look at some topics. Actually, if we can just go to the next slide. Uh, we're, going to, we're not just going to focus, we are going to take you through the calculation because that's always the take home and the most important aspect. But we, we want to cover a number of issues that we don't think have been focused on in great depth in, in other talks <coughs> and articles that we have so far had a chance to look at. Um, and we will, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer uh, panel. What we're going to do, because this is going to be a wide ranging discussion between us, we're not going to have a formal Q&A at the end. If you have burning questions and answers, please type them up. And we're going to see if we can incorporate the answers during the presentation. If we don't manage to do that, as those of you who are familiar with 39 Essex webinars know, you send your questions in and we, we the panel, will answer them afterwards. Um, also, don't worry too much about having to focus on the really nitty gritty when we get to Ashley's section, because this is all being recorded and it will be on our website. And quite apart from this, you should al already see that we've got a case digest that is, is on the website. Uh, we will have an article coming out in our newsletter, which Emily deals with, which will be in the next week or so. Um, and I think Daniel Lakin and maybe others are going to be doing podcasts. So there's plenty to keep you occupied, a, a veritable cornucopia of delights. So Ashley, can I just um, have the next slide, please? What we're, we're not going to have formal slides covering every topic. We're simply going to highlight um, headline issues. Uh, and then we're going to discuss them amongst ourselves uh, and uh, hope that we get that right. Um, I, I'm going to start just by looking at some procedural, the main procedural issue, which was the uh, aspect of obtaining permission to adduce additional evidence in the Court of Appeal. Um, just the briefest of overviews, you go back to uh, Mrs Justice Lambert's judgment in first instance judgment and if you note at 127 she deals with the issues in relation to accommodation um, and Roberts and Johnson calculation. Um, and she says and sets out that there really were only four proposals that were put forward or four options that were put forward. I'm not going to trespass on Emily's um, section when she comes to the, 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 the way that these proposals were, were panned out. But um, the interest only mortgage proposal was one of them. No evidence brought on that at all. Uh, interest only mortgage paid by PPO. Again, that was that was meant to be taken from without evidence. Uh, the, the main punt was for a Robertson Johnson calculation with a different rate of 2%, but again, zero evidence to support that argument. And then there was the, the rental option. So that was the situation in at first instance. And then by the time we actually got to uh, the Court of Appeal, as you will all remember, there were two uh, hearings. So we started off in July 2019 on the 23rd and the 24th of July. And it was at that hearing that the appellant uh, made further submissions. In fact, 
really saying you didn't need expert evidence to make the propositions that were going to be put forward. Um, but it, there was a long discussion between the parties uh, and the interveners in the Court of Appeal. And I think what the take home from this is that uh, it's quite clear by the time you see the transcript of those hearings that the Court of Appeal had been motivated enough to grapple with this issue. They wanted to deal with it and they wanted to deal with it properly. Um, and so they very unusually uh, allowed the additional expert evidence to be both obtained and then called in evidence at a further hearing. Now, we, we know what the respondents' arguments were, the Ladd and Marshall arguments and so on and so forth, but the claimant's argument was, was very much along the lines of cost. And it, there is a valid point. When you have a judgment that at first instance has to be binding on the first instance judge and can only be turn, overturned by going higher, it, in circumstances such as that, one can see with the constraints of either legal aid for a claimant or a conditional fee agreement, there isn't the money, nor is there necessarily the focus to know what you're needing to have the expert evidence on. Yes, Emily, you're going to say something. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, picking up on that, I think also, to be fair, that approach, although it is unusual, was actually supported by the Court of Appeal because they ended yeah. up saying that, of course, it, that it, that it is binding, and that at first instance, um, the judge had done exactly the right thing of saying, I can't deal with this, but giving permission to be heard. Because, of course, um, in the JR, in the earlier case, there was a suggestion that, um, you know, should I tinker with Robert to Johnson or should I not? And the Court of Appeal very um, firmly said, absolutely not at first instance, it has to come up to us. So in some ways, that, as you say, the, the cost matters aside and, and issues aside, that... that, that um, process was endorsed. Yeah, and I agree. And we have been thinking amongst ourselves about, um, obviously, one of the things that was stressed by Lord Justice Irwin was that this was a wider public interest issue. But it's not impossible to imagine other cases where there would be a wider public interest issue in, re in, in making that application in different cases. I mean, one of the, one of the aspects we thought about was medical science, where things may move on and where there's a wider public industry where you cannot have the money to go into the in-depth analysis at the first instance trial. But once you know what the outcome of that decision is, that's when you start to grapple uh, with the real scientific evidence. Um, so we could, we think, apply in other cases. Obviously, it came with a health warning from uh, the uh, Lord Justice himself. Um, so that's, that's an aspect that I think bears us considering. But obviously, once one starts looking at the detail of the procedural issues, Emily's going to tell us a little bit about uh, exactly how the appeal itself uh, narrowed down those issues. So the next slide, Ashley. Thank, thank you, Susan. Well, as, as Susan touched upon, there were a number of solutions that were canvassed and predominantly at the, at the I mean, that, another unusual thing is having sort of two court of appeal hearings with a big gap in between. And of course, that gap in between, um, a lot of time was spent by the parties negotiating in the background. Um, so although there were a number of options that were originally canvassed when looking at how wide one should look and what potential solutions there may be, most of them, in fact, were abandoned uh, before the um, full hearing. Um, or, or, or on appeal. Uh, so if we have a look at the abandoned issues first, and then we'll move on to what uh, formed the nuts and bolts of the Court of Appeal, not least because one of the things that we've been considering are when, Smith, um, sorry, when Swift doesn't fit the bill. So when there may be instances when some of these abandoned options uh, could come into play. Uh, Ashley, so can we just see the next a, slide? Yeah, I was gonna say the next slide will show us the options that were offered. Um, so the, the, the first point, um, which we'll come on to again in a minute, was what was the Court of Appeal able to do on, on this instance? And uh, were they able to challenge the proposition of Robertson Johnson? Um, was it uh, principle, a matter of principle, or was it guidance? And of course, as you know, the decision was that it was guidance uh, given the particular economic situation and the particular circumstances. And therefore, since the underlying situation of Roberts has changed, 
uh, SWIFT gives an opportunity to reconsider guided to pragmatic negotiation of claims. And very much the um, um, headline um, from Lord Justice Irwin was recognising that what needed to be done was come up with a pragmatic solution to enable the myriad of claims that all sit behind those very few that go to court uh, to continue for business as usual, for negotiations, for reserves, for insurers to offer the claimants to know what they're asking for. So by the time it came to options being offered to the Court of Appeal, only two were put forward as being suitable in the Swift and Carpenter situation. Um, the first was whether you should look at the full capital value of the additional sum required, so simply looking at how much money is needed. And in particular, that was the solution effectively that was offered in JR, and that essentially was why um, that claim didn't go any further. Once you've been given the full capital cost, you don't need to worry. And, and while that might have, seem to have a certain sort of madness to it, in negative discount rate world, um, if you apply the negative discount rate to Robertson Johnson, it comes out as a cheap option. So um, bizarrely, offering the full back, um, you know, can, can upon on occasion be appropriate. But the more nuanced um, basis was really the one that occupied the Court of Appeal and, and which forms the basis of the SWIFT decision, which is looking at that capital sum, so looking at the full value required to purchase a property, but then trying to reflect upon the windfall value. So essentially, if you buy your bricks and mortar at X price, you sell them at Y price, and given uh, Britain to date, who knows what's going to happen after January, but given Britain to date, that's generally meant you've ended up with a property worth more um, than that with which you started. Uh, that windfall basis, that additional value of your bricks and mortar um, at the end of life needing to be considered and taken, discounted from, from the value of what you're given initially. And that's really what the reversionary interest means. And if you think about the sort of underlying principle of reasonable compensation for a claimant, the ideal being you spend the last penny of your damages sum the moment before you die. Um, and a perfectly crafted damages sum lasts you that long and no longer. And of course, you know, that's impossible, but the reversionary interest is a principle to try and look at what that increase of value may be and remove it from your benefit. So if we look at the reversionary interest, how do we calculate it? And that's what we'll come on to. But actually, if you can have um, just show me on to the next slide, before we get on to the exciting thing of what was done, we'll have a quick look at what wasn't done. Uh, because these abandoned options become the, the sort of points of interest, uh, as I say once again, when, as the Court of Appeal says, SWIFT doesn't a one size fits all. And so some of these may be options to be considered in different circumstances. The first is an interest only back. Say, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Can sorry. I say, one of the things that I just want us to, to tie in here is this interesting link, which with this, these were the options that to start with, the appellants were, were yeah. proposing. So they were in fact um, off on one track. And I think they were brought back to some extent by the Court of Appeal themselves, you know, rather like uh, we all have that embarrassing moment uh, where you get into the appeal court and the, neither party has thought of the argument the Court of Appeal produces it. So, yeah. And what it, were you going to say, Charlie? I was simply going to say um, on that topic, I mean, one of the things it's easy to forget, even for those of us who spent ages uh, dealing with these various problems and, and um, various alternative ways of dealing with things uh, before JR and therefore before Swift and Carpenter is that the idea, for example, of a 2% discount rate calculation, um, even though the negative discount rate was applying for other purposes, was very common at the bar. We were settling cases on that sort of basis. So the practical approach did inform the way the submissions were being put before the court. And uh, it's easy for us to say now, well, that, they, there was no evidence in support of that, uh, like the court did. But I can completely understand why those submissions were being put that way. It was just the way we were used to dealing with these things. Yeah. And indeed, um, if we think of all the cases in which there have been attempts to bring actuarial evidence to support <laughs> various aspects before we got into a, a, a neat ta tabular form, uh, which were sat upon, by uh, higher courts, so one can well understand the reluctance to feel that that was going to be an attractive option. 
Yeah, and of course, there's always been that pushback against a sort of actuarial instance by saying, well, I'm a judge and I can look at the particular uh, claimant and tailor an answer to their particular needs. And in some ways, in some ways, actually, by suggesting that uh, what is needed is guidance that's uh, pragmatic and, and, and good for settlement, which is quite a lot of the underpinning of what Lord Justice Owen talked about, one's actually going back a step and saying, uh, well, you can have a bespoke claimant outcome, but also we recognise that most of the time you're going to actually sit around a table and, and, and uh, for want of a better word, carve it up. Um, uh, and so you need to understand a, a sensible principle on which to do that. Um, I, I, I think the other thing is, is, is the way that, you know, Roberts got sort of um, squashed between uh, two decisions. And at the time when Roberts and Johnson came up with the percentage principle, that was because the idea of um, the interest rate on the mortgage was pretty similar to the discount rate and the idea that that the two would would, would end up being much the same. Um, and it's only once you then had the Wells and Wells and the Thomas decision and this suggestion that it would be pegged to the discount rate um, that, that, that the, the, the um, dissonance between um, the property price rise and the discount rate became sort of fixed um, but, but, as a matter of principle. Sorry, excuse me. No, no, no. Just also, just to remind us all, because we, we, we need to bring it back to the real world as we when we talk about um, interest only mortgages and indeed when we come on to talk about the reversionary interest and the calculation, you've got to understand the evidence was that there is no uh, bank that would uh, support or pro provide a product of an interest only mortgage for the life uh, of, uh, or for the questionable period of life of a claimant. Uh, and so, Neil, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, what I, Neil gonna say? I just sound a note of caution about um, the flexibility uh, of the court because in Wells, um, it, it was, um, expressly stated um, that one would look at the circumstances of individual cases and come to um, a just decision. And on each occasion, um, when the English courts reconsidered uh, Wells in the context of an individual case, um, they were not prepared to move from the um, established discount rate. The only time when that happened was when looking at, uh, um, at um, the Channel Islands, and, and um, I, I would sound a note of caution that I think it would be very difficult to move away from um, the reversionary interest option that has actually been chosen, and also it would be very expensive for any individual claimant now to challenge that because they will, in, in effect, have to reproduce all the evidence that was um, put before the Court of Appeal in terms of financial advisors and actuaries and the like, and there will be a huge reluctance to embark on that process. No, that's a, that's a fair point. That wasn't um, quite what I was thinking of. I was thinking of exactly that, that, that what the courts tend to prefer is a, um, a, a, a relatively simple broad brush approach. And actually what I was particularly thinking of, although this is going way off piece, was the, re the reluctance to embrace the um, disability calculations in Ogden and to, um, uh, to use that sort of statistical actuarial evidence um, in a broader um, uh, claim. But that's going way off where I'm meant to go, so I'm going to haul myself back to abandoned options um, <laughs> and, and absolutely take on the chin what you're saying, Neil, about um, there's never been a, any success at getting away from Wells and Wells in the English courts. Um, but I think what is important is to have a look at um, the abandoned options, not least because the Court of Appeal does obviously leave that window open by suggesting that SWIFT doesn't necessarily offer a one-size-fits-all uh, approach um, when, when it's saying, I, I accept the suggestion of the intervener, this guidance should not be regarded as a straitjacket to be applied universally and rigidly. There may be cases where the guidance is inappropriate and while there, as you say, it might be a brave claimant that seeks to put themselves in that place. Nonetheless, that, that door is still ajar. Um, however, how far that door is ajar rather does depend on the financial pa packages available, of which um, the main reason the abandoned options was because nobody was prepared or able to provide a market solution at the present time. So the first one being the interest-only mortgage backed by a PPO, 
Well, that went because however agreeable that might sound as a solution, there was no financial institution offering the product, uh, which makes it a bit improbable. Um, the second, the life multiplier versus times the mortgage payment is that uh, because at current rate, that actually um, costs more uh, than the capital, which goes back to what we said about JR, of paying the full lump sum of the price was better than a negative discount rate. Um, and that, that the same goes for rental costs, although one may deal with rental costs in a different way if you had a claimant that was never likely to buy a property. And I think that's the other thing. This is predicated on the assumption that the claimant either already owns a property or was highly likely to own a property. And there will be circumstances when that's just not the case, and therefore you'll have to look at it differently. Anyway, the third one being a loan from the defendant to the claimant with a charge over the property. Well, that was out for the defendant in this instance because the insurer wasn't financially regulated to provide it. And um, one only needs to remind oneself of the poor little uh, French um, uh, notary who bought from Joanne Calment in France. Sound has gone a bit strange, Emily, just there. for two seconds at the crucial moment. What's the matter? Uh, sorry, what's happened? All right, it's okay, you've come back. Perhaps it was oh. me. <laughs> Probably sorry. Um, I was just going to say that carries a risk um, um, of a loan with a charge um, of a life expectancy that was um, unexpected as Jean Calment um, happened when she lived to be 122, and the reversion of the interest at rental rates was taken out when she was 90. Uh, but that's a whole other story, best served over a gym. Um, but there are definitely situations uh, in which um, options may be a matter of principle, but as Neil rightly says, one has to be cautious. Um, so now I'm gonna hand over um, to- Can I just- Barney. Oh, sorry. Just before you hand over, just to, to tie it and remind those, and that is, that is why it's so important to remember that Swift and Carpenter used the paradigm case, agreed. And, and when it comes on to the various calculations, Ashley will deal with that. Yeah, okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Because I think my internet, my internet connection seems to be unstable. I'll take it. Let me see. Can hear you fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to deal with the question briefly of what the Court of Appeal did about Robertson Johnson, which is easy to sort of gloss over because we all know that um, it's, it's essentially dead in the water now, but it's important to analyse precisely what happened. Two issues, was it binding on the Court of Appeal? Uh, and if not, should it be departed from? And the was it binding in the Court of Appeal is an important uh, issue both historically and in terms of potential future significance. It's easy to overlook because what one focuses on in this case, and when one's trying to distill it all down into a single paragraph as a cut out and keep, as it were, uh, is the solution to the problem which the Court of Appeal proposed. But we do need to look at the route map by which it got there. Robertson Johnson had been part of our legal landscape for 30 years. Uh, with its application to a majority of catastrophic cases where at least where accommodation was needed. It always proceeded, even on its own terms, <coughs> forgive me, on a slightly pragmatic basis, uh, the ad hoc nature of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul approach. The assumption then was that house prices would continue to go up, although funnily enough, they didn't, as I remember to my cost in the immediate aftermath of the early 90s. But ultimately, of course, as we all know, the problem was that they went up too much, not just a problem with the windfall at the end, which was what the, the problem it was designed to deal with. It became a problem with purchase at the beginning, which is what was creating a real world problem for claimants. Uh, and more recently, that was combined with the related, but actually analytically quite separate, problem of negative discount rates, uh, so that the artificial mechanism for calculating the value of this loss produced a negative figure or nil. I do remember situations where um, defendants, uh, I think I pleaded it once, defendants were taking credit for the uh, increase in value from the, uh, because of the windfall. So it, it was creating real uh, juridical problems. Um, then the question of if it wasn't binding, 
should it be departed from? Uh, and as Lambert J herself said, uh, it, it was an, producing an unsatisfactory result for all the reasons described above. Um, the Court of Appeal, as Emily has reminded us, said she adopted the right approach, saying, saying that and then giving permission to appeal. So what did the Court of Appeal actually do about these two things? Well, it, first of all, it decided, this is the next slide, please, uh, Ash. Um, first of all, it decided that Robertson Johnson wasn't binding for all those reasons. Two specific ways of putting it. First of all, Robertson Johnson is guidance, not principle, um, a distinction which is an interesting one um, for us to look at. Uh, and secondly, the, the detailed reason, the nature of personal injury law in practice, the rarity of court hearings, the prevalence of settlements, all things that we know are absolutely uh, meat and drink to the way we do our various practices. We all know our cases never get to court. Um, uh, and, and that was one of the frustrating things about waiting for a court case to tell us what to do here. Um, the need for clear, predictable guidance in settlements and indeed to judges. Now, uh, the interesting distinction between guidance and not principle is one that had been raised in Mauer, which was the case you'll recall about the uh, calculation of fatal accident act dependency damages, uh, whether to take it from trial, uh, whether future loss from death or from trial. Uh, and that distinction didn't uh, end up helping the claimant in that case, but it does here. And, the, uh, and, and, and that's what they found. Um, and what uh, Irwin said about this uh, is interesting, and I'm just going to read out a couple of passages. Um, guidance is given often with an express indication that the guidance is based on change conditions and might be altered by future changes, albeit implicitly significant rather than trivial, trivial changes. Where such guidance is given by an appellate court as to how best in the currently prevailing circumstances to comply with legal principles, in this instance, fair and reasonable compensation, but not overcompensation, then it seems to me conceptually correct to recognize that it is guidance and not an enunciation of legal principle. Now, there's an element of sophistry about that, but I think it's sophistry which we could all understand um, in the circumstances. And so he goes on, it appears to me that the reasoning in Robertson Johnson was a means to an end, not a principle uh, or, or an end in itself. Uh, it does apply to this case, but in the form of an authoritative guidance from the court, given the specific conditions prevailing at the time uh, of, of the decision. And in fact, guidance is demonstrated now to be ineffective in achieving the object of the relevant principles of law, namely full compensation without overcompensation, then the court can revisit and alter such guidance. And that, of course, is exactly what it did. Now, that does raise the question, as Susan has touched on already, of to what extent might one pray and aid that sort of distinction in other cases? What other areas are there where convention has created practical get-arounds in practice, which we use on a day-to-day -day basis, but are becoming increasingly either unsatisfactory or simply not up to the job in, in, in relation to the particular case we're dealing with? Could the approach be changed uh, by resort to this? And one obvious example, it seems to me, although I don't want to talk about it at all um, just now, is the life expectancy issue, the familiar problem of how to deal with extraneous life expectancy evidence on either side. Um, may, maybe there are challenges to be made there. But anyway, the bottom line uh, is... Robert... Just, just, to, just to interrupt there, of course, we need to remind everyone that uh, the Court of Appeal was pretty strong in ring fencing this and saying um, that it's not for a first instance judge to, to leap over this barrier and you need a very very strong case. Um, I'm just thinking aloud and we'll come back and it's I'm not meaning to, to, to interrupt for too long but I mean I've got um, a case coming up which is a wrongful life effectively case. Now that's a whole stream of law that is utterly binding all the way up to the Supreme Court but uh, matters have moved on apace since the original judgment. So I think, I, I think I'm really interested in whether we do believe we can use um, this judgment to help us to persuade courts 
even if not at first instance, certainly first appellate courts to consider they might have power to uh, change the change uh, what what is said because it's authoritative guidance and not a legal principle. What do we think? Well, I was just thinking when we were talking earlier about um, um, changes with um, surrogacy, actually, and of course that's taken years and years and years to change. Had to go right the way up to the Supreme Court when uh, you know uh, Lady Healthcare. Well, actually, you know, I think oh, well, I might have said that. I might not have meant it, but I'm definitely wrong. But, you know, that's a long, long pathway. Um, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, another really good example is obviously fatal accident claims. I mean, obviously they're statute bound, but they've been long wrong. And Cookson and Knowles was a kind of bet noir for many, many years of people recognising it didn't fit um, everything that had happened thereafter. But it took a very long time in many, many courts, you know, to get right up to, um, to final courts. I think the, the problem is that for most I was going to say claimants, but actually for most parties, it's unlikely to be worth it. The having to go through all of the hearings, then following this line, you then have to go to the Court of Appeal and then they make your application to evidence and then get your evidence and then have your argument. Well, that, that's my, I've always thought there should be some cases where you can actually propose a principle without it having to matter to an individual because it's so easy to buy off a potentially expensive change of principle in an individual case. And it would be wonderful if we had some structure by which we could get the higher courts to consider matters of principle as it were almost in a vacuum because that's the difficulty, isn't it, for the practitioners on the ground, both claimant and defendant. It's cheaper <laughs> to, like in JR. And not many people want to be guinea pigs. Yeah. But I mean, to take, to take me back just for a moment to, 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 to what I was saying, that, which is pertinent to this, the, um, the, the relevance, the, the reason why one would want to do what Susan has just said, which is um, get a case that is just before the court, um, even if it's not, even if, in order to make the, get the principle right, rather than simply um, take all the risk being taken by the by the individual parties in that case in order to justify getting that principle right, is it, that was exactly the situation here. What the court was trying to achieve was a, a way of dealing with all of this, uh, which would avoided the need for expert evidence in every case, but was simple to apply, even if not to explain. We'll find out about that in a moment. Uh, that's what it's tried to achieve, and it's, that's what it's done for good or ill. But the upshot is, and it's important to realize this, it's created another formula like that in Robertson Johnson, albeit one that is more up to date. Uh, it's just as artificial, just as constraining. And I believe it'll end up having a similarly limited shelf life. Well, I think we know that there's an application. It's, it's open knowledge, isn't it? That there's an application for, to the Court of Appeal for appeal to the Supreme Court on this. Yes. I think it's going to be here, was it the 23rd of October? I was just asking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was all I was going to say. I mean, I've put, I put on the next slide um, the uh, equivalent uh, dictum by Lord Justice Underhill, uh, but I don't need to read that out. It's the same point expressed slightly differently. Ashley, you're going to now take the master class. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, well, if, if any of you are like me, the terms market or notional reversionary interest are enough to make you shudder. Um, but we've got to deal with it because the Court of Appeal have decided that we have got it. Um, so starting out what did the, with what the Court of Appeal decided, uh, quite simply, they decided that a 5% discount rate would be applied by reference to a market reversionary interest. But that's all very well and good. What does that mean? What is a reversionary interest? I'm going to give a very short uh, beginner's guide to that. Uh, why might it be said to be notional and why have they come up with a market rate? And then finally, how do we deal with the um, calculation in respect of this? Now, starting with the first point, um, the reversionary interest aspect, um, in certainly the accommodation or property context, a reversionary interest can be looked at as an interest in a property that reverts or is returned to the owner or the beneficiary of the property at the expiry of an event, usually at the end of a lease or the death of a person. Now, that's a mouthful, I appreciate that. Um, however, what does that mean? I'll, I'll give an example. 
A very simple example of a reversionary interest is where a son or daughter provide their mother or father with a life uh, interest over the property. Uh, the father uh, or mother die and it reverts back to the son or daughter. Uh, this is typically held in what is called a trust. So that's the reversionary interest. Just to give you a, a, a brief guide as to uh, those of you that have forgotten about that. It is some years since I've dealt with those. Now, how does the notional aspect or the market aspect come into this? Well, that's going to need to be considered or, or for me to consider um, how and why the Court of Appeal wow. decided what they did. Um, in the case. Now, the Court of Appeal seems to have taken, as Charlie, I think Emily have already touched upon, um, some uh, the pragmatic reasons. Um, what the Court of Appeal effectively said to come up with the market approach was they wanted certainty during the negotiations. As I'm going to come to in a moment, there's a calculation that can be performed and that should help both claimants and defendants in terms of their negotiations. There's a recognition that the vast majority of PI claims will never reach court, as Charlie has just said, and that was the frustrating part about this. And I think in addition to what Charlie mentioned before, uh, the Court of Appeal felt that there'd be additional cost benefits. Uh, there is now, and I think for some time, a, an actual recognition by the Court of Appeal about the pragmatic approaches that personal injury lawyers have to take on a day-to-day -day basis. Whilst we're all looking for principles to follow, actually on a practical basis claimants and defendants have come up with some solutions um, to aid uh, settling discussions at joint settlement meetings and uh, of course prior to court but i think this is actually the court recognizing that um, situation uh, no expert evidence is required under the current guidance and it seems to me that some might say that the Court of Appeal should be applauded for that. I know perhaps some of my colleagues wouldn't say that, um, but it is pragmatic and the parties know where they are. However, I've already seen um, some commentators deal with the fact that this is, as I say, highly pragmatic, um, but it's uh, said to be unprincipled, some people have said, and uh, it hasn't followed decades of precedent. Uh, the Court of Appeal have in effect uh, relied on a single expert, Mr. Watson, and actually uh, imported their own percentage uh, for the purposes of the calculation, which actually the only expert that was qualified to deal with it didn't um, necessarily support. Uh, the market for reversionary interest is incredibly small. And the idea that the decision of the Court of Appeal may create a market, uh, I think was um, somewhat optimistic, but we'll see how that pans out. So however, in terms of how the market and the notional interest aspect of this have come, come about, um, they, they provided now a simple solution to uh, dealing with this uh, for the benefit of, as I say, claimants and defendants. Um, now, the next thing which uh, many of you uh, may want to um, take note of, uh, Ashley, this, these say, slides and just say uh, quick, yes. before we go on to this most yes, complex, the PhD. Yes. I mean, I think we need to remember because just as we were talking earlier about there being no market for the interest only mortgage, etc., yes. there is precious little market <laughs> for notional yeah. interests. No, no, there isn't. And if you look at what the decision actually said, there were four to five uh, actual sales uh, per year uh, with the individual companies that were involved. So there is next to no market. And I think it is um, like Robertson Johnston. Uh, this has been uh, highly, uh, uh, well, it's been not, not made up is perhaps not the right, right term, but it's been contrived to try and attempt to do fairness to the parties. And as I said earlier, it's um, trying to do that by way of allowing some capital costs yeah, to uh, it's, it's the property. It's Charlie's point, isn't it? It's Charlie's point from earlier. This is actually a really incredible example of the Court of Appeal going an extra mile to yes. try to provide a framework out of effectively thin air yes. so that there is certainty going forward, albeit not necessarily the most perfect certainty. No, but, but two points arose out of the defendant's uh, yeah, position. Can, I, can I let Neil oh, me... Yes, of course, of course. Uh, it, it seems to me that the um, the overriding principle in, in um, George and Pinnock that the, the claimant shouldn't get a windfall uh, has been totally discarded by the Court of Appeal uh, here because um, the one thing that's absolutely certain is that the, um, the, the claimant who, as in um, a case where they get £500,000 subject to uh, the calculation that Ashley is going to take us through uh, will die with a capital asset that is still worth perhaps three hundred and fifty 
thousand pounds after the calculation, but in practice will die with a capital asset of five hundred thousand pounds plus inflation. Um, so uh, I, I would suggest that this is simply a device um, to try to demonstrate that there would be some adjustment to the capital sum, but mm. it certainly doesn't deal with the windfall argument. Yeah. But no, it's no. Proclaimant, isn't it? Everyone has to know it definitely is proclaimant. I think it's difficult to see how many defendants, you'll be interested to see the Q and A's, how many defendants are really happy with this. Yes, but I, but I think- If I can part... also just say the other thing that is interesting is I think it goes right back to that fundamental idea of the extent to which you know, we still have this um, great principle of calculating each head of loss precisely for a head of loss, but absolutely no policing of how the money is spent thereafter. And so, uh, you know, from one example, you can spend all your money on a Ferrari, should you so wish, and no one will come, assuming you're not a protected party, no one will come to the claimant thereafter. But it also means that on a daily basis, claims are settled knowing that the robbing Peter to, to, to pay Paul principle will come into effect. And I agree with Neil that, um, I mean, the reversion of interest is just a mechanism by which you, you the Court of Appeal, I think, seeks to try and reduce that element because it's also recognised that most of the time, under Robert and Johnson, the, which is another method of calculation, provided not enough money to purchase the property and therefore as a single great expense, the claimant was having to take the money from other heads of loss. Um, and, and it's an attempt to perfectly or imperfectly redress that imbalance, because of course that's one of the areas where the Court of Appeal disagreed as to whether or not that uh, the, the, the Robin Peter to, to, to pay for poor principal yeah. exist at all and, 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 and felt, felt that it shouldn't. I think we'll let, well, let's let that's Ashley enough. go back into, oh, sorry, Charlie. Charlie, you're unmute. All I was going to say was it is true that the Court of Appeal were in disagreement on that, but it's interesting to note the nature of the disagreement. It was disagreements between Underhill on the one hand and uh, Davis uh, and Irwin on the other as to whether you should uh, have the whole capital sum or the whole capital sum less the reversionary interest. Uh, and uh, that's the answer of the majority were in favour of the latter, which reduced the claim, not increased it. Yes. So it, it, it's, it, it, this was very much, if you're looking at it from was it a claimant or was it a dependent prison, this is very much a claimant decision. Yes. yes, Charlie, I, I agree with that, but I, I just wondered to what extent, without being overly critical of the defendant's submissions, uh, all of the solutions that seem to be provided ended up in an ill result for the claimant, and I just wonder whether or not getting some form of hybrid approach might have been a better tactic, but there we are. The Court of Appeal seemed to be pretty uh, set on the reversionary interest approach, so I'm not sure what difference it would have made, new, but there we are. New, in, new evidence in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Shall I uh, deal with the calculation? Put our then? wet towels around our heads and let's go. Yes, yeah. all right. Um, I'll just say uh, a couple of things before I start this. Uh, the first one is these slides are uh, going to be uploaded. And the second thing is, as is the seminar. So you can have a look over this again. Um, this calculation uh, works, of course, uh, also we wouldn't have put it up there. There is a slightly different and a more detailed way of dealing with it. If anybody wants that, feel free to uh, email in. But this is supposed to be a way of quickly calculating uh, accommodation uh, claims uh, now going forward. So uh, on with it then. So a value of property now required, the injured property as it's been uh, termed in Swift and Carpenter, a million pounds. Value of the property would have bought 500,000 pounds. Difference 500,000 pounds. Uh, even I understand that. Um, the client, claimant's life expectancy we're taking as uh, being 35. Now is the tricky bit is what you do to get the 5% um, discount rate. And what you've got to look at is something called the negative power of 35, right? And this is the bit I'm gonna take you through step by step. This is the clever bit as it were. Now, if you use your calculator in landscape, uh, not all calculators um, have this. Um, but if I could just show you, 
Uh, hopefully it comes up okay. I'm um, sure if it will or not, uh, but it's on the landscape uh, format. Um, there should be a little X and a little, a little Y button there. So you take the 1.05, which is taking allowance of the 5% discount, which is on the left, then you insert your 35 uh, 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 and, and you, that provides you with the 5.516. Now, this is, uh, if you've not used the um, iPhone a bit, you may want to use a pen and paper, but as I say, you can come back to this. Uh, now copy this figure, press and hold, then press one and press the division symbol. So you should be able to paste the copied figure back in, but you must press the equal sign. You'll have to try again if it doesn't work first time. I have to confess it took me a couple of times to do it. Um, the figure you get is 0 0.181. And then you multiply that figure by the 500,000 pounds and the result is 96.45. You simply then deduct the 500,000 for the damages and you end up with 409.355. Um, as I say, you can go back through that again. It definitely works. I can provide a more detailed breakdown of that uh, calculation should anybody uh, wish to have that. What I also did was, I, forgive me. Further, can I just say thank you so much? Because frankly, no one, I mean, apart from, I think Dan Herman, I'll give him a credit from Stuart's, but you know, he's on Twitter, so it's public and I can say it, who was doing a little uh, walk through with this. I, as a woman who never did maths at A level <laughs> uh, and scraped through GCSEs, was absolutely floored by this. You know, the, the negative powers are a difficult concept for some of us but to get. They are. So but thank they you. Are not, not at all. I just wanted to say one more thing, uh, and it really leads on to the next and final slide. What, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and hopefully I can bring others in on this. But I've done the same calculation on a 10 year life expectancy. Uh, and that comes out with uh, financial, uh, forgive me, final accommodation damages of 193,000 pounds as opposed to the 409,000 pounds. So, so, so you end up with a situation where the lower you go, of course, the, the less money you're going to have. And you're going to end up in a situation with shorter life terms of five, six, seven years of not really being able to provide the accommodation. Um, and perhaps, um, I think we have had a discussion about this uh, previously, but I wonder what everybody thinks about what the solutions to the short life expectancies are or might that, be. That's the part that was left open, very specifically, wasn't it? Uh, or I think agree by um, Lord Justice Irwin, because the paradigms, which you can see there, the annexes at the end of, of the Court of Appeal judgment, are all based upon long life expectancy. And we are in a minefield in my view when we still get back to short life expectancy. And I, I just want to throw it out there. Let's obviously, as many people know, I act mainly for claimants within um, th these catastrophic injury type cases. Uh, and many of my claimants live in council houses um, or, or some sort of subsidized rental accommodation and would never have bought at all and they have a, a let's say a cerebral palsy child they need to move but the child's ex life expectancy is like 15 years but i think the rental oh. issue is very difficult all around um because there are essentially two ways that you can you know if you're looking at purchasing a property and doing a reversion of the interest calculation on that purchase Fair enough. you would have remained in rental accommodation all your life what what you do with that rental money because you can get very significantly different results. If you take the rental off the capital value and then do the reversionary mm. sum, you get a much higher calculation than if you do the reversionary calculation and then remove the lifetime rent. And arguably the second is the more principled because uh, you wouldn't have any benefit from that rental money, it would just be money spent. Um, so, Arguably, you, you know, you look at the capital value of what's going to be purchased. Do a version Neil, of I really want you to. Yeah, I want but to but that's all. But that's all. That's just yeah. another you gloss. Because Neil acts. Yeah. I mean, you act, you act for both claimants and defendants, but you have a heavy. Yeah, no, sure. So let's, let's yes, hear. I mean, I, I would say that um, the major criticism of Roberts and Johnson, certainly in the years before the negative discount rate, was that it didn't provide adequate compensation for claimants with a short life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's no doubt 
um, supr both surprising and disappointing, um, that that major flaw, as was suggested certainly by claimants in Roberts and Johnson, hasn't been addressed at all in, in a judgment that is specifically said to be looking at the wider public interest and to provide guidance to um, the representatives of, of parties in these cases. Um, and um, it probably isn't of much comfort to either party to get the answer, well, um, you have to take the rough with the smooth. What works out as a benefit for some uh, is a detriment for others because a claimant only has one claim whilst um, a defendant has a book of claims. So a defendant could say, well, it evens out between the long and the life and the short life expectancy cases. But for a claimant, that doesn't happen. And I suspect that there are a lot of people now looking uh, for a group of uh, short life expectancy cases to take back to court, which isn't of great benefit to any of us. Ashley, you were going to, I think we, we sort of completely hijacked <laughs> what you were no, saying. No, not at all, not at all. No, I was just um, wondering what suggestions we could provide. I mean, with claimants, of course, with a short life expectancy, it might seem to be unfair to put them in some form of um, uh, a, a rehabilitation unit for three or four years. That's carries with its own problems. Um, there isn't an easy solution to this at all. And certainly in some of the claims I've uh, acted on, um, we've, we've, we've certainly had negotiations dealing with rental properties. And then we've had to find very, in very difficult circumstances, rental properties that could be adapted. And that's been incredibly difficult, but we have managed on occasion to do that. Um, so that's perhaps one solution to the shorter well, term. Can I jump in? because we've got a question from someone on the floor, brave person, one question. And, and this rental cost is undoubtedly one of the most um, intricate and difficult problems because the question is, with a reduced life expectancy, won't the claimant mm. just seek rental costs for the new property? Yes. Of course, you've got to give credit yes. for whatever rental costs you would otherwise have incurred. Um, and you have to remember, one, as, as, as we all know, landlords are not very amenable to disabled um, or critically ill uh, and, and people renting their property, they're not amenable to adaptations. And you've no. got, you have to keep changing but, your rent. But, 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 Su but Susan, like you've said, um, a lot of um, certain claims I've acted for in the past have had uh, been living in local authority housing and the, the local authority have at least been helpful in that respect in terms of allowing the adaptations in those circumstances yeah. so long as there's a space it's to do it. Houston and Roy Yard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I have something on it. Yes, Charlie. So, um, I, I think the answer to the question that's been posed on our chat line is yes. Uh, and and it, uh, it, 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 the, the such claimants will claim rental costs and that will be reasonable because it, it precisely because it's a short life expectancy and therefore you won't get the problem of a rental cost being greater than capital cost which was what always was happening before with those claims when the rental was being presented as the way of doing it in a normal case simply because they've been rented uh, for a long time the problem with the short life expectancy is of course that it's an obvious point but precisely because there's a very short life expectancy, the windfall element of the normal way of looking at the case, uh, whether it's a capital cost or capital cost less reversionary interest, is very, very great indeed compared with, with that that would otherwise be so. So, um, I, I'm sorry, in the context- well, that, that should therefore presumably encourage it and of course, let's think in a lot of these cases, I mean, not all of them, of course, because we have adult road traffic accidents and, uh, and catastrophic injuries there, but there's still a huge number of cases that are dealing with childhood uh, acquired brain injury or birth injuries. You will not have had, so it will be, the cost of the rental will be there simply to the point of death. And that is perhaps, uh, we just have to look at the figures, but it's probably a better option for defendants. And I, I, I might bring Neil back in here because of his experience there. Then if you have a short life expectancy, if you, if you run the rental under a PPO, you're going to be better off than having to chunk out a whole capital sum. I would be uh, surprised if claimants ultimately would go for a lump sum settlement on the basis of a short life expectancy times the annual rental because mm 
the question that the relative will ask is what happens if they outlive their life expectancy? Uh, and it's a very serious problem. One way around that is uh, whilst the current Court of Appeal decision probably renders PPAs for accommodation unworkable with the, the, the way the calculation is done, um, it brings back in PPOs uh, if the rental route is, is taken. And um, as we know, um, both claimants and defendants, depending on the facts of cases, have different views about whether a PPO is, is the appropriate way forward for them. So I, I suspect that um, only in a very small number of cases will renting in practice uh, work um, because you have to find the property, you have to find a landlord who will allow, and let's face it, we're talking about adaptations usually on a property of two or three hundred thousand pounds. It's not a minor adaptation. Um, but maybe also you might find that some of the other options become more attractive in the particular circumstances okay, of, of looking at um, uh, you know, a, a defendant providing a capital cost because you're not going to have the time over which the windfall will grow um, and, and, and maybe actually purchasing a property and managing it if there's a, if the, the financial ability to do so, but having a more, not necessarily a PPO and rental, but um, some kind of more nuanced form of, of managing the property um, for as long as it may be, because of course you've got a less time for the windfall to grow, to, 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 to um, create its own iniquity. It also makes the um, the Neil Block approach to negotiation of, uh, <laughs> of, of um, seeking to avoid breaking down offers into individual heads of loss rather more attractive because we can each sell it to our own clients in whichever way we think is best. Which goes right back to the Peter and Paul principle. Yes, and, um, yes indeed. You know, take your money and do with it what you will. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are at 11.59, <laughs> so I think we've kept within our time limit. We could go on, as you can see, we're all very animated by all of the issues that arise from this. Um, it's not the end, without a doubt, but we're very grateful to all of you for listening to us today, and we hope that it has been informative and to some extent a humorous way of being able to look at this rather heavy topic. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to leave the meeting now. And as I say, it's all recorded on the website. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye.